It's not often I get to the end of a build and are content with the finish, but this Vesper Tiger was the closest I'd come in a long time. And what better way to finish the model off than with a small vignette? Some of the Christmas decorations we'd bought came in a small timber display box, and like most of us modelers do, I'm always looking at ways to incorporate everyday items into the hobby. I thought this little box would make for a handy plinth and would be a perfect way to display the tiger. I spent the next week of planning the build, setting the groundwork, making a haystack, planting some crops and building the scene until I got to the point where I threw all my toys out of the cot and the base went straight in the bin. I hated it. I mean really hated it. But let's focus on the positives. A couple of weeks ago, I took the leap into the world of 3D printing and purchased a Frozon 8K Mini from a good mate of mine. His help setting it up was invaluable and I was up and running pretty much the same day. I'm bringing this up because it was my access to this machine that would allow me to build the scene you're about to see in this coming video. One of the gripes of 72nd scale armor modelers is the lack of choice when it comes time for choosing your figures. I was amazed when I started looking for files to print the number of high quality figure files that were available. Most were 135th or 116th, but with the software and the 3D printer, I had the ability to easily scale the figures to the size I wanted. I found an amazing set of figures on Colts 3D. They weren't cheap, but man, they were good. The set had six German tankers in fairly relaxed poses and would be perfect for the little scene I was concocting in my head. Designed at 1 16th, I was concerned at how they may scale, but the finished parts were absolutely incredible. The supports were carefully removed and the figures were primed in a Mr. Surface of 1500. The primer can often expose issues in the prints, but these look really good and would more than do the trick in the scene. I also printed a couple of pigs for the scene I had in mind, but a little more on that later. Painting 72nd scale figures can be a bit of a shift in mindset, and whilst the techniques I'm using will work on most scales, I find the small scale figures need a greater contrast from the darker colors to the lighter colors to make them stand out to the naked eye. The other factor to consider with these figures is that the German tanker uniforms were black. However, if I was to paint them just black, they'd all but disappear on a base at this size. The black primer gave me my base to start from, but the black grey colour would be my base layer for the colours that I was going to build on. The bulk of the uniform was painted in the black grey from Vallejo, with only the most recessed areas remaining the black from the primer. I then went to the paint shelf and chose a basalt grey for my mid-tones and a pale grey for my highlights. A small amount of the paint is applied on a wet palette and that gave me my range of working colours. I'm then able to take a small amount from the black grey and mix it with the basalt grey to give me my mid-tone between those two colours and then took a small amount of the pale grey to mix it with the basalt grey to give me that mid-tone between the lighter two colours. I now have five shades of grey I could use to build the colours on the tanker's uniforms. Using a fine brush, I start to build up the colour on the figure. The mid-tone grey is applied over any raised areas of detail and I'm looking to cover about 80% of the surface area. I want the most recessed areas to still hold that black grey colour and I'm trying to blend the colours up to the peaks of the shapes and contours on the figure. As well as considering where the light may be illuminating the shapes of that figure. I start with the mid-dark mix and then move to the straight basalt grey, each time with less coverage than the time before. You'll also notice that I'm keeping the paint and the brush wet every time I load it up, and then releasing the excess from the brush on either a piece of paper towel or on my hand. You can always tell the figure painters when you look at their thumbs covered in multicolored lines of paint where they've unloaded or tested paint flow. I then move to the second lighter shade and am working on the reduced footprint of the coverage. 
Only this time I'm using the colour to pick out the details like the collar boards and the collar around the jacket. These details are then highlighted using the pale grey to help them pop. Under the macro lens it can look very structured, but looking at this without magnification is a completely different experience. It's all about building up the contrast in the shapes. Time to paint the flesh elements on the figure and painting the flesh always brings the figure to life no matter what the scale and I have a bit of a system to do this. The three colours I use are Bugman's Glow, Cadian Flesh Tone, both from Citadel and a light flesh colour from Vallejo. Just like with the greys, I apply a small amount of each colour on the wet palette and mix up my mid-tones using each of the colours to give me my working colour palette. I also add chocolate chipping to the colour palette and paint the belt in that colour to represent the leather at this stage. I like using the lighter tone for the belt because it helps break up that black uniform and gives the figure some definition. But back to the flesh and I base coat these sections in that Citadel colour called Bugman's Glow. The paint is pretty quick drying and dries very cleanly which speeds up the whole process. I then move straight to the Cadian flesh tone and look to cover about 80 to 90% of the surface area of the flesh areas using this colour. Only the most recessed or shadowed areas will still be using that darker tone. The two colours work in harmony to present an even skin tone. I then move to the two lightest colours and again work in that reduced surface area. The lightest tones are focused on the noses and tops of cheekbones and to the tops of the forehead. And by keeping the paint reasonably wet, I'm able to keep it semi-translucent, which will help to blend the colours. I'm also able to use the mid-tones of the flesh colours to highlight the belt again. Again, looking to broaden the contrast in these areas. The detail on these figures was extraordinary and even the badges on the jackets required a touch of steel from ammo. It's an acrylic paint used just to highlight them. I finished the figures with a couple of Citadel washes. Reikland Flesh Tone and Nuln Oil are pre-thinned shade colours that will work perfectly as a wash. A small amount is loaded onto the brush and is then touched against the face and the colour flows through the recessed areas and brings the detail in the face to life. I'm not looking to flood the part, but trying to let the paint run into those recesses in a controlled way. The null oil is used in the same way, only around the deepest recesses of the uniform. This will help define the shapes and help the lighter highlights integrate with the rest of the figure. Two figures down and I was pretty happy with the results. The pig was next up and was painted using the flesh tones, only this time I added a touch of pink into the mix. It's cliched I know, but it seemed to do the trick. The figures are then sealed with a matte varnish and they were ready to go. I enjoyed every step of these figures from finding the files to printing them and then to finally painting them and it was such a joy and they'd worked perfectly for the scene I was building. The matte varnish seems to hide a multitude of sins on these figures as well in terms of any stepping lines with my graduations or gradients. Now back to the base and to be honest with you I was scarred from my experience of my first attempt. I hated it and I nearly gave up on the whole project. I think it was the pressure of presenting something I wasn't happy with and getting it finished for the video that was troubling me the most. But I decided to start again and whatever would be, would be. I had an old timber base in the stash and started by taping the edges to preserve the finish. A quick test fit gave me the feel for the dimensions and how the scene might sit over the shape of the base. I was inspired, although very loosely, by this photo of the tiger leaving the road and moving into the field and set about trying to replicate something similar for my scene. The base was first covered in an air drying clay to set the foundations for the groundwork. The clay can crack if it is applied too thick, so I tried to spread it as thinly as I could using a spatula. 
Unfortunately, my clay was old and difficult to work with, a uh, little bit like me, I guess, but a bit of muscle managed to move it around. The spatula marks were removed then by wetting my fingers and smoothing the clay with my fingertips. While the clay is still wet, I sprinkled soil over the surface. This will create earth textures in the groundwork and help create some depth within it. I don't want the granules to sit on top of the surface though, so I used my fingertips again to press it into the wet clay to help integrate it into the groundwork. I had an old vinyl tiger track in the stash and that was used to press the track pattern into the clay whilst it was wet. These tanks weighed 54 ton, so it was only logical they'd leave an impression everywhere they went. I then used the spatula to depress a very basic road section and smooth it out further with a touch of water and my fingertips again. To integrate the way the tank would sit in the ground, I removed the clay from around where the tracks would be sitting. This would help the model look like it had settled into the ground rather than floating above it. A small amount of PVA glue can then be applied around the sections that will be the fields and are distributed then by using a fan brush soaked in water. The finest static grass I had in the stash was about 2mm and rather than apply that with a dedicated static grass applicator, I just used my fingers to place it over the glue that I just applied. Because I'm working in such a small scale, I didn't want the grass to be sitting too proud. I liked how it looked by simply flattening it with my finger. Flat earth and wooden deck tan are then used to set the foundations for the earthy colours. I used the flat earth in a shading fashion, focusing around the edge of the road and the ruts. I'd come back to the deck tan, but I next moved to paint the grass. Foliage green is sprayed as my base layer to set the tones for the grass. Yellow green is then sprayed to brighten the grass sections up. I'm trying to spray so the paint catches the tops of the fibres and the deeper green tones are still the foundation. The tone is brightened up even further with a diluted yellow, however this is applied in a smaller area than the previous highlights were. Then back to my deck tan to fill in some of the dirt clumps in and around the grass, as well as highlighting the sections on the dirt road. I wasn't loving what I was seeing, but felt a little relief when the model was in place and a light wash using shadow brown oil paint was applied around some of the rocks and pebbles in the dusty areas. Then to finally blend the whole groundwork, a dusting of the deck tan is misted over the whole base. I wanted to use a basic fence in the scene to add some interesting visual elements, so the posts were roughly cut from a piece of balsa wood. A micro drill is then used to drill three holes in each post, and a fine lead wire was fed through the holes to connect all of the fence posts. I'm planning on having the fence in the foreground, so the hope is that the wiring will not interfere with the scene, but will add something interesting to the story. The wire on the fence was blackened with an AK burnishing fluid. I could paint this, however the blackening fluid won't chip like paint on metal can, so I figured this was the best option for this application. I marked out the positions for the fence posts and drilled a couple of small holes to place them in. A touch of super glue was all that was required to hold them in place. I wanted to add something with height to help create some depth to this scene and figured a telegraph pole would do the trick. I'd managed to source one on Colt's 3D again and headed back to the 3D printer. I'd given myself a few options for the height so I could pick the most appropriate one. The 84mm tall one seemed to do the trick so I drilled a hole in the base and went about painting it. The pole from the print was way too smooth for my liking, so I was able to run the edge of a razor saw up and down the length of it a few times to create some timber grain through it. The pole first received an undercoat of light sea grey, and soon after I used the basalt grey and loosely painted in some grain lines. This was more about getting different tones in the finish rather than creating grains as such.
I then go back to the pale grey and look to add some highlights and a few additional grain lines in that lighter colour. An enamel wash winter streaking grime is then applied over the entire pole as a bit of a sludge wash. And while the paint is still wet, I look to remove it using a tissue. This should leave the paint in the recesses I created using the razor saw, as well as giving the entire pole an overall weathered and tired effect. Back to the fence posts and all that was required was a touch of that winter streaking grime again to enhance the timber colours that were already present in that balsa wood. A small piece of green stuff putty was used as the footing for the pole. Once the putty is dry, it should give me a strong foundation for that pole to remain upright. I feathered and blended the putty ball so it was integrating with the ground work around it. It was all just a matter then of adding a little more foliage and static grass clumps to the base to try and help with that organic volume and add some life to the groundwork. Most of these elements can be bought off the shelf, however it is possible to use foliage you can source from your own backyard. There was a little bit of dead space towards the back of that base, so to add to the drama and use that space a little better, I draped a downed wire on the road section using a strand of lead wire. I love the natural way the lead wire can be shaped to give it a sense of weight. The model was then glued in place using PVA glue and the figures with just a small touch of super glue. The tape was removed and the vignette was now complete. Working title for this one, Are You Thinking What I'm Thinking? I love the casual nature of these figures draped over the tank and then that unexpected element of the pig in the foreground whose fate may be looking a little grim at present. I nearly didn't have a video for you this week due to the dramas of the first base I was planning, but I thought it was important to share some of the disasters so you know it isn't just happening to you. The base was a good reminder for me how much I have to learn about my landscape bases and it's something I'm really wanting to improve on in the new year. This was my final video for 2023 and I'll be having a break for a few weeks. I truly appreciate the support and encouragement I've been afforded here and I absolutely love the community we're building together. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'll be back in early 24 with all types of content, reviews, full builds, showcasing techniques and who knows what else. You never know, I might even spread my wings, but that's a conversation for a whole different time. Remember guys, this is the greatest hobby in the world. Share it with your family, share it with your friends, and let's be proud of what we do. From my family to yours, wishing you a Merry Christmas, a Happy Holiday, a Happy Festivus, whatever it is you choose to celebrate at this time of the year. Thank you again to you all. I'll see you again very soon.